Greg Tate, the renowned cultural critic, producer, musician, and authorian on the Afrofuture and Afrofuturism. We are here with the enigma, the dapper one, the provocateur, <laughs> and the instigator who takes an idea, blows it out of proportion, and creates a musical melee of mm. sorts. I mean, you are a cultural critic, Afrofuturist, conspiracist, and and I, I was a great guitarist. Is we got a lot of other things we call them. <laughs> I, I like cons big conspiracies. Talk about even, so that. You've been reading my Facebook page. Well, yeah. Speaking of complete artists, so you're a writer and a musician. I mean, how do those two art forms sort of influence each other in your life? Yeah. Um, well, I know, I mean, I, I, I come, you know, kind of from a time in D.C. when every brother I knew in my high school, like, we were all trying to play guitar or bass or drums, right. and everybody had a little... A little band so um, but when I started writing um, for the Village Voice mm -hmm. like in, in the 80s like the best compliments I ever got were people saying when I read you I hear the music mm -hmm. you know whatever to, you know whatever music mm -hmm. I was writing about because I was really trying to that's what I was trying to do I was trying to translate mm -hmm. kind of the, the the passion and the rhythm and the color and texture of the music into into prose. We tend the ancestral flames. We recall all the names. In wonder as we wander. Healing was being torn asunder. The angels of Okanda. Angels of Okanda. We tend the flame. We call the names. Greg, I'm wondering how the future of right now and the foreseeable future, <laughs> especially for folks of color, may intersect with the notions that we've all developed about Afrofuturism. Well, I think that um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, Black people's powers of, of invention and reinvention and uh, this whole, uh, the whole place of conjuration in the culture, you know, of bringing together um, one's uh, expressive capacities, one's pursuit of uh, magic in execution, in expression, um, to really elevate uh, your, your community, your audience, um, your spectators. Um, you know, um, and I think, you know, everyone is caught up, caught up in, a, in a kind of limbo, a kind of a lurch trying to figure out well, how do I take this gift that I have that is so much defined by how I interact with folks in social space, you know, or how they interact with the work? Um, what in the foreseeable future um, can be an altered, you know, uh, adapted platform that has the same kind of uh, efficacy? you know, uh, the same ability to create call and response, the same ability to do what, you know, we see D nice doing, um, yeah. uh, you know, how do you translate that to, uh, to, to other mediums, you know, while we're all in, uh, in this purgatory and, um, and, you know, I, I, I'm pretty confident, you know, given the, uh, the astronomical degree of creativity there is in this city in particular, um, yeah that we're gonna see some very novel responses to you know, the, the, the time of pandemic.
Greg, you're sitting over there in front of a laptop. And I'm, I know you, I think I met you first as a journalist. So I'm kind of convinced that you're sitting over there writing articles, <laughs> pretending that you're like making music. What is the, there's an interesting balance between being a culture critic and music <coughs> critic, and then also a music maker. Yeah, um, that last piece was called "Less the Devil Do." Um, a lot of times when I'm um, just messing around uh, in my little garage band. Yeah, about ten years ago, I was uh, I was in Paris actually with um, a good friend of ours, a poet performer named Mike Ladd. Yeah. And, um, and I think like a lot of people, I thought Garage Band was kind of like this toy program uh -huh. that Apple would just install yeah, yeah. in the thing. But Mike was actually doing a workshop with uh, kids out in the, uh, the Bon Luge, mm -hmm. you know. So I said, wow, that's kind of dope. You can really do a lot of things with so this. So Mike taught you how Mike to use this Mike showed me that there was really something there. And then I just became obsessed and for the next seven, eight years. Following, you know, okay, yeah, I just okay. So we have like an insider scoop and what you actually oh, yeah, doing yeah. on that keyboard, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And the title for the band definitely came from our uh, the, <laughs> the title of the album came from just having us having one of our pun filled back and forth conversations. And I said, deja vu to relative to compare it to who knows what. Mm -hmm. and he said, Oh, that's great, I yeah, think that's the title of the album. I said, mm -hmm. Cool. Do you identify yourself more as a writer or more as a musician? Uh, I would say I think of myself as a, a um, an artist who communicates with uh, with words and sound. And um, one of my editors uh, at the Village Voice, he made this comment once. He said, uh, "He said all of my all of, all of my black writers uh, write like preachers, mm. you know." So um, I wasn't aware of necessarily having a ministry at the Village Voice, you know what I mean? Because uh, people tell you if you're reaching and communicating, you know what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. like, once you turn in a piece of writing for, in terms of journalism, it's like, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, there's a time lapse in terms of, it's not immediate feedback necessarily, but, um, um, but I always, because I was such a, tried to be a close listener to the music, when I started writing, about it, I was trying to translate um, what I heard into into words, you know, into into words that had um, the same kind of uh, uh, dynamism and and rhythm and flow and um, um, capacity for um, spiritual mental stimulation, you know. So that was that was the mission, you know, um, and. Um, when I, I think the thing about playing music is that, because um, I came to performing music fairly late, you know, I'd always kind of, everybody in my high school was, you know, was trying to be in a band, but I didn't really get serious about it until I was about 35, you know, coming out of Black Rock Coalition and just seeing all, just being, just being inspired by my friends, mm -hmm. you know, Vernon Reeds and uh, Melvin Gibbs and D.K. Dice and Jerry Allen, all these folks, you know, you're around that kind of greatness, you just feel like, Man, I gotta at least try to do this. You know what I mean. And um, but it, as somebody who was writing as a journalist, what you learn once you had to present your thoughts and feelings and and presence on stage was respect for the preparation mm -hmm. and a respect for anybody who walks walks that mile from backstage to mm -hmm. right in front of folks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. So. It def and it was definitely humbling, you know, because I remember the first di first gig I did with uh, Women in Love, uh, a good friend of mine, a writer, Michael Gonzalez, he said, yeah, man, a bunch of us came down there just to see you F it up, right? And I did F it up, <laughs> you know what I mean? But but from being around great people, yeah. some of the musicians I mentioned, I, I'd seen them have bad gigs, and I was like, yeah, ain't, ain't no bad gigs, you just make it up on the next one, so. I'd like to, to ask, who came up with the name Rebella? Probably Tate. Oh. How did, I should have known, right? So does it refer to part of the back of the brain, or is it, um, <laughs> because, um, the Well, I did have another band called Medulla, Medusa Oblongata at one point. 
You know, Medusa, I'm not. I'm yeah, not, so I may, I may be working my way through the anatomy. Okay. Various, okay. various, my various my herbs and spices. My, <laughs> what was um? What would you say is the main um, distinctive difference between the Rebellum um, Ensemble mm -hmm. and um, Burnt Sugar, burnt, uh, the Burnt Sugar Orchestra, orchestra Chamber? Uh, three minute songs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, because as opposed to thirty minutes off. Because mm -hmm. you you were thinking a pair of, this rebellum is more like a pair down of of into something that maybe is more commercially palatable, but it seems like you guys are still quite far outer than most of the stuff you hear on the radio. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean they're uh, they're they're uh, bite sized songs, but I don't think they're uh, uh, they're quite radio friendly yet. Is, is that yeah. is that ever? You know, <laughs> you know I, I moved to New York um, uh, from D.C. in 82, you know, so I feel like um, I got the experience downtown New York, you know, like below 14th Street when it was really, really, really hot and popping. The cultural mecca of the universe was, was downtown New York, you know, um, and it was kind of one of the reasons, you know, people came to New York. Uh, to try to make it as artists, there were a lot of venues to try to get your thing on. A lot of places to kind of mingle and interact, you know, with other creative folks. And, um, you know, kind of discover your voice. And, uh, and I was writing for The Voice at the time, so I got to kind of cover hip-hop as it was emerging and house culture as it was emerging and the jazz culture of the, of the 80s and 90s as that was emerging. And spoken word, poet, seeing a couple of generations of that, you know. so. Um, you know, it was just, yeah, it was just really rich. You know, Brooklyn was kind of like another epicenter, obviously, you know, for folks in that time. It's where a lot of folks lived. That was my first, my first neighborhood was Fort Greene. If you were hanging, you know, Brooklyn was the place, you know, that was kind of like the, kind of the mecca for kind of this new community of artists who emerged. The Black, what did you say, the Black Rock Coalition? Coalition, yeah, yeah, that's an organization, um, a group of us founded in 1985 to kind of address um, the erasure and the denial of, of black folks that space in the, in the music industry of that time uh, to play our own music, you know, and uh, confront uh, racism in the industry in the other ways it presented itself. But also, you know, going back to what you said about, you know, not carrying anger forward you know what we realized when our first meeting we got together and you know we were just you know glitching and moaning you know and then uh and then about an hour later we said okay what are we gonna do well, we're gonna start putting our own shows we're gonna put our own music out you know what i mean so it became very proactive very much about this community in celebration of our of our tradition of our ancestors and 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 kind of showing people um what was meant by you know, talking about a, a coalition of black folks who rock, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So we took to the stage in the downtown uh, scene, you know, we did a three-day festival um, at a, with kind of the premier downtown rock club, CBGB's, wow. you know what I mean? And put all our bands up there. And, um, and we, you know, we also wrote a manifesto where, you know, we just said rock and roll is black music and we are its heirs. Yeah, you know, and, and what was interesting is that we got more response from people in, from non-musicians in the community than from musicians. Because we had musicians straight up tell us like, y'all are, you know, uh, you're throwing your careers away, <laughs> you know, trying to bring politics into music, you know what I mean? And then um, a few years later, the flagship band, Vernon Reese Living Color, they got a Grammy. And the next thing we knew, it was full of bands, full of, <laughs> full, of, full of cats who wanted to jump on the bandwagon, rather, you know what I mean? But Coalition's been around, um, you know, now almost 35 years. You know, and um, and we're still, um, you know, representing, um, you know, for for Chuck and Lil Richards and Bo Diddley and Jimmy and all, you know, P Funk and all those folks, man. You know, the you, songwriting process. Do you do you do you? Um... I, I mean, you know, pretty much like anybody else, just beat on this <laughs> thing until some coherent starts to happen, and then. You start to think about words that actually fit with that. Um, and then I give it to these folks and it turns into music. Mm -hmm. you know? 
So a lot of things done in the, the recording studio or in the rehearsal studio or in the bedroom Just, or man. whatever. The bedroom. Woo! <laughs> Easy now. <laughs> Truly. It's all, it's, all, it's all happening there live at Shea Tate, you know, <laughs> up in Harlem. Man. But, um, yeah, I mean, just about any imaginable way that you can think that people get together to make music, mm -hmm. we use it. So mm -hmm. write songs in the studio, bring complete arrangements. There's some things that are um, in the history of the band that actually have been notated, you know. Um, um, people, you'll send people lyrics, uh, and they'll do the vocal in their, their home, send that back, you know, that'll get on the album. So, you know, we'll put anything on the album, <laughs> however, it, however it arrives to us. So you titled your super, your super size 20 song LP, The Darkness. Mm -hmm. So what is the, the darkness exactly, metaphorically speaking? It's also looking at that porous relationship between uh, dream and reality, mm. you know. As uh, Terry Collier said, when you fall asleep, what is it that's lighting up the dreams you see? Mm -hmm. You know, the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a thing we call American exceptionalism. I call it American self-deceptionalism, um, where there's such a bubble of privilege and entitlement and, and kind of feigned innocence around what's going on anywhere outside of people's immediate circumference. Um, and so you have this uh, pandemic, which is moving in the areas, um, you know, it's kind of uh, slouching towards uh, you know, the mid Midwest and, you know, um, uh, the, the cornfield states, you know, of, of America. And, um, and that's changing, you know, this culture of denial, this culture of uh, deceptionalism as well. So, I mean, all these things are on deck um, as we move, we move forward. But I feel at the same time that um, 
what artists are going to do with their uh, empath empathic uh, capacities and their um, prophetic, generative, uh, expressive capacities is um, give us a sense of uh, how magnificent uh, human beings can be um, when they share their gifts for um, saying what can't be said through ideology, what can't be said through journalism, you know, when they use this, their psychic telepathic abilities to kind of reach us on these deeper inner spiritual levels, you know, so that we're really in touch with, um, you know, our, our, uh, our most um, kind of enlightened and, and uh, con cosmically and uh, socially connected selves. Greg, can you remember, why did you become a musician? No, I became a writer. You became a writer first? Yeah. And then I'm trying to become a musician. <laughs> what did you say? Well, you... I just forced these people to indulge me. <laughs> with, their, with their superior wit and talent. Yeah. Well, I've heard you play, so I know you're a musician. You can't fool me. Okay. I know a musician when I see one and when I hear one. But why is music so important to you? Um, I think, like a lot of us, um, it just transformed my whole sense of what the world was, what the possibility of the of communication, collaboration, community was, mm -hmm. you know, um, and um, really just provided just so many alternative visions in sound. Mm -hmm. to what we were given as uh, mundane, as so-called mundane reality, you know. Yeah. So it offered you the, the opportunity to immediately um, engage, jump into the fantastic. How, how are you able to keep all focus on all these creative um, tri tributaries, you know? No, we, the I one mean, cohesive stream. No, we, I mean, we're, no, we're just inspired by people who didn't have any boundaries. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, so the, the people we draw upon were people they didn't really believe in this notion that, um, or this notion that, you know, genre, you know, set a limit on your creativity, mm -hmm. you know, and they mixed and matched and blended and dissolved and distorted and <coughs> disintegrated and reformulated all of them, you know, uh -huh. sometimes in the same song, uh -huh. you know. So I think everybody here um, was, you know, just kind of moved to think of music all as. Um, a kind of very animated, lively uh, set of colors operating on the same palette, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. Maybe the gods sent that to well Made her love you when you shot it to hell Ooh, that dragon fast asleep in the mail Belches that fire when you reach for his tail was so quick put down the cave and commitment hit OG going on three average price paid for a dog on a leash say you love a magic you know the truth she speaks foolish young cold like he's hanging feet say you love a magic you know the truth she speaks foolish young cold
know, Greg Iron Man Tate, the... Oh, the instigator. Instigator. <laughs> That's a good word. It's Avant Groy. Avant Groy. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's always something rustling around the back of my brain, as, you know, these folks know, so... Uh, yeah, it's just looking at the whole question of uh, creating self-sufficiency, you know, within these um, endangered urban spaces, you know. So thinking like the original folks thought out there on the veldt in the Kalahari, you know, like uh, two million years ago. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, those Africans. Mm -hmm. you know? But I like something Frank Zappa said, you know, he said, um, he said, um, you know, music is the only religion truly worth believing in because it's the only one that delivers the goods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is from my sympathy. A race out of empathy. Taking our blues back. And all our unruly symphonies. Maroon to rain, subject to pain. Maroon to rain, everything to gain. Taking our blues back in all of our new symphonies. Maroon to rain, everything to gain. Maroon to rain, subject to pain, everything to gain.